Okay, we left off with uh, Bernini's David, and now we're going to move into a little bit more architecture. We discussed some architectural elements uh, with Bernini with St. Peter's and the Baldacchino um, uh, hovering spiraled altarpiece in St. Peter's. Now we're going to talk about um, Borromini, and we're going to discuss just you know briefly what uh, Borromini did that changed the architectural face, if you will, no pun intended, in the facade in particular to begin with of a lot of the uh, churches and cathedrals at this time, in particular cathedrals, because again, we're talking about Italian Baroque, so we're discussing uh, Catholic influence, all right, from the papacy. So we're going to look at San Carlo, which is figure 24.8, um, then also the diagram and the inner dome of um, Sant'Ivo, and that is going to be figure 24.12 and then 24.13, which would be the inner view from below of the dome in Sant'Ivo. Okay, so let's begin with figure 24.8, which is the facade of San Carlo. And uh, what Borromini did is he, A, learned from Michelangelo because with the exterior of St. Peter's, Michelangelo took on as an, as an art. So he did everything. So he was your painter uh, with the Sistine Chapel. He was uh, the renowned sculptor for Rome. He also worked on architectural elements such as St. Peter's. And what he did is he created a system of undulations around the dome of St. Peter's in Vatican City. And uh, Borromini learned from Michelangelo on how to create what's called an undulating surface. And prior to that, the surfaces of a lot of the cath uh, cathedrals and temples and, and, and such and churches were very linear and very rectilinear in nature. But um, what he is doing is he's creating, again, the sense of complexity and the sense of drama, which is very Baroque. And creating this constant moved curve, which is that um, scene here in figure 24.8 with the facade of San Carlo. And he creates this curve, this undulating line based off of a mathematical relationship of concavity and convexity. So concavity is where the curve dips in away from you, and then concavity is whenever it bends out towards you, all right? So he's creating this undulation, and you can see that facade there with San Carlo. Now, what uh, Borromini does uh, versus Michelangelo prior to this is he informs the inside of a similar type of undulation. So if you look at figure 24.12, Borromini's plan of San Ivo, alla uh, Sapienza in Rome, you can see it's an aerial diagram or a schematic of what the layout of uh, uh, San Ivo looks like. And he's taken here in particular what looks to be rectilinear on the exterior and he's converted those undulations to the inside you can see where it bends in and out and again uh, Michelangelo did this with uh, with um, um, St. Peter's on the inside a bit as well and created that Greco cross with a whole bunch of different smaller domes that are surrounding the main dome in the middle so uh, uh, Borromini is taking that to the next level in this Baroque period versus that high Renaissance period of Michelangelo. Um, and you can see that um, very distinctly in figure 24.13 um, and you see the constant undulations almost like this clover-like shape where you have it bending in in concavity and then bending back out in convexity and how it's creating this undulating pattern that continues all the way up to the top of the dome. So essentially looking at architecture is taking on those dynamic, theatrical, elaborate, and dramatic um, and passionate approaches to organization of the material. In this case, the marble uh, and the stone in particular is taking it on in an architectural feat versus that of the sculptural elements that we saw prior to with Bernini. 
Now comes the gadsfly. Now comes the uh, rogue of the period. Um, we're going to get into painting now. And painting is going to, again, take on the same components as the sculpture and the architecture. It's going to be very dramatic, very theatrical, and very moving emotionally. And the main individual that's going to influence this time in painting in Italy and also over into Spain and even up into uh, the northern Baroque uh, in Europe, the northern European Baroque area, is Caravaggio, figure 24.17, Caravaggio. And, um, but the one that I want us to look at in particular, um, the, his paintings start at 2417, but the one I want to look at is 24.17a, uh, Conversion of St. Paul. And um, a little bit of history with uh, Caravaggio is uh, he was... He was a tough guy, and he was often always in trouble, but he was always uh, uh, giving flack for the classical artists. So he was giving flack, um, kind of talking down about the classical Renaissance artists. So he wasn't very well promoted in Italy because of that, because he was dogging Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, just just saying no that's not the answer you know uh, that has been done let's create something new so his pulse was always on something in innovative and he took some of the t classical techniques like the chiaroscuro and um, the naturalism and he really built upon that and he wasn't liked for it because he wasn't emulating anyone so whenever a commissioner would come in and ask him to do a piece of artwork, they would say, I want you to do it like Raphael. I want you to do it like Leonardo. I want you to do it like Masaccio. I want you to do it like Michelangelo. And he would just say, no, I'm not. I'm not going to emulate them. I'll do it my own way. And in turn, he actually became the emulated. So with his new style at this time in Italian Baroque, he became a trendsetter. And many of them emulated him instead of him emulating others because he stuck to his gut. He stuck to his heart on exactly what his work needed to look like. He, I always joke and say he's kind of the middle finger uh, artist of the time. And anytime someone approached him, he would be just like, nope, not doing it. I'm going to do it my way. Either you like it or you don't. And he had a lot of people following him indirectly and slightly directly. Um, and, and because of that, he became the cornerstone of the Baroque art period, uh, both in Italy and in Northern Europe. So with conversion of St. Paul, let's talk about what he's doing here and how it's different than the classical artist. Um, there are a few similarities that he is pulling from the Renaissance. The first is uh, use of naturalism, really focusing on the importance of the nature and the environment surrounding the figures. And in this case, you have the conversion of St. Paul who is on the ground because his heart has finally been struck into conversion, into uh, following the teachings of Jesus. And he's at the point where he has, finally, he has fallen to, in a humble sense of dramatic way, with this diagonal. His body is diagonal in the composition, which creates drama and excitement and complexity. And he is, the, he is very minimal his body itself in the composition in comparison to the natural environment with the horse and the equestrian trainer next to the horse on uh, um, above St. Paul. And um, this, is, this is really quite something because the main biblical figure is very diminutive versus the rest of the environment. But he uses something from the chiaroscura technique and expands upon it into what's called tenebrism. That's T-E-N-E-B-R-I-S-N. -E and by using this expanded and more elaborate and dramatic use of shifting of heavy light and heavy darkness, it focuses on the chest cavity and the arms of St. Paul, which highlights him and actually makes him a focal point. And using different colors, like the greens and the orangish reds, make him a focal point, though his body is very small in, in the uh, foreshortening of him at that diagonal than the rest of the environment that he's in. 
but through that technique of tenebrism, it accents the figure. So that is a big um, advent that, or invention, I should say, that Caravaggio did that certainly brought upon a whole new wave of painting. And, um, and what Caravaggio really wanted to do, he wanted to reduce the story down to human drama. So he wanted to emphasize the active point of drama in St. Paul's life that finally brought him to the conversion and following of Jesus's teachings. And by doing that, he's creating a very harsh and dingy setting. And if you look back at figure 24.17, where Caravaggio is creating the calling of St. Matthew, this here, you can see Jesus's character shrouded in this darkness, but the light emanating from his skin and the very subtle halo around his head as he points very leisurely with a very uh, Renaissance-like point. So if you look at the hand of Jesus in figure 24.17, calling of St. Matthew, that figure hand that he has is similar to the hand of God in the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. It's very similar. So he's pulling from some of these Renaissance classical artists, even though he's like downplaying them. Um, he's pulling from them and giving some due respect by emulating it slightly, though he said he wasn't. And then you can see St. Matthew at this time, a tax collector is pointing at himself and he is highlighted in this light. Again, using this tenebrism to emphasize the spiritual awakening of the individual. So St. Matthew has now officially been converted into the calling of Jesus in figure 24.17 using this tenebrism, this highlight, like the spotlight, the spiritual spotlight is now on him. And he has to act and he has to now choose to follow Jesus, which he does. And then in figure 24.17a, St. Paul, the same highlighted element is placed upon his chest, which is a symbolic emphasis of his heart being converted to the teachings of Jesus. So Curious, or uh, Caravaggio is going to be the one who uses this, com this uh, composition of dramatic human experiences being converted to a spiritual awakening through this tenebrism. And he creates a dingy and harsh setting and really dark because that's the material world. And then the highlights of the light upon the saints that are being converted are, that's the emphasis of the light. That's the spirit is coming out in radiance, in this luminous radiance from these characters based off of either Jesus pointing at them directly or it happening in the heart of the saint, like with St. Paul in figure 2417a. So this tenebrism is considered a shadowy environment that shrouds the figure. So Caravaggio is seeing how dark the material world is, and the only light is really your conversion to God through his proper teacher. Uh, and, and in these biblical narratives, it's Jesus. Um... And he adds to the emotional symbolism of the painting by, again, casting that light upon the chest of St. Paul and upon the face of St. Matthew in the two different paintings. Okay? So, remember Caravaggio. He is going to be the core, uh, the core influencer, if you will, throughout the rest of the Baroque time and even into the 1800s. And one of his followers um, is uh, Gentileschi, and uh, she is a prominent painter in uh, Italy that actually helped move and promote Caravaggio in Italy, even though the papacy and the papal states of Italy, had they didn't want anything to do with Caravaggio. They thought his technique was too dark, it wasn't ornamental enough. Uh, it was too violent, um, but he was trying to emphasize how dark this world is without your love for God. And that's why he used that tenebrism. And Gentileschi, was her father as an artist, was very respected, and she became very respected as well. And <clears throat> um, 
she used these tenebrism techniques that Caravaggio had, and she learned from him. She studied from him. And she created this Judas slain Holofernes, which is an Assyrian king, a uh, polytheistic Assyrian king that was there to invade. And, um, and uh, he, he wanted to seduce her. He ended up falling asleep. She comes into the tent and decapitates him. So the use of this violent scene is very important because it shows the light that comes out of the darkness. So Caravaggio, Gentileschi, and a lot of future painters are going to use these dark, dark environments and these violent, dramatic, theatrical themes because that is Baroque. And they're going to use these narratives to show the light that's going to be radiating and coming out of these acts. So you should notice by now a lot of these Baroque sculptures and paintings are in motion. All right, it's acts that are in motion. You know, Paul fell off of his horse. Here, the decapitation of Holofernes is happening with Judith and her maidservant. Uh, so Baroque is all about that theatrical performance and that's what's ensuing here. So uh, she, Gentileschi, is very interested in the nature and the drama like Caravaggio. Um, because of her Italian success, it gave it, it gave respect to Caravaggio, even though he wasn't there. He had already been kicked out of Italy by this time. He literally was exiled out of Italy and I think a couple other countries too. Um, and that tenebrism here is creating a very tense and strained subject matter. And, and there's a use of highlighted uh, light colors and an emphasis on the action in the foreground. So the foreground is where she has her left arm pushing down uh, away from Holofernes's head as she's moving the blade of the sword with her right hand over, uh, over his head. Um, so it just shows the sheer amount of strength that she has in her right hand to pull that sword towards the neckline and remove that head. Uh, not needing to use two hands, but just one. So it shows the power and the dramatic emotion and the empowerment of uh, Judith um, at this time, which is which is a bit a very prominent biblical uh, character. All right. So there is an example of Caravaggio's influence. Let's deter just a little bit from the influence before we get into Spain, and let's talk about. Um, Goli, Goli, and we're going to look at in particular figure 24.23. And there's some really cool inventions that are being used here that I'll talk about that's a little different than uh, what we talked about with the tenebrism of Caravaggio. And um, the, the so let me just break it down here. This piece is called The Triumph of the Name of Jesus. And remember, we still have the Catholic Church influencing all these commissions. Okay, so there's still very much reference based off of the biblical themes and a Catholic symbolism in particular, and that's very present here. So one, um, he's painting on the ceiling. Okay, so the last time we saw the painting on the ceiling was with the Sistine Chapel with Michelangelo. And here uh, we have the ceiling uh, painted um, and what they're trying to do. Now, remember, the Catholic Church is trying during this Counter-Reformation is to show the sheer elaborate ornamentation and elaborations on the, the dominance of the visual arts through the papacy, through the papal states, through the pope. All right, through the Catholic Church. So they're doing all of these grandiose things to invite you back into converting into Catholicism and following the Catholic Church. So in this case, what they're doing is they are creating this illusionary opening into the heavens, into the celestial realm, by painting the center of the barrel vault in a Gesu, by exposing it as if you're entering into the heavens or the heavens is descending down upon us. Uh, so it's a very intentional choice to create uh, this ceiling pattern by having the center be painted as if you're opening up into the portals of heaven. 
Um, and it's very dramatic, so you can see that there's figures everywhere, and you have two different types of figures. You have figures in the center in the opening into the celestial realm that are ascending into heaven. And then on the lower section, I believe it's the southern part of the painting, you have figures that are being cascaded out of heaven. And those are the sinners that are being brought to the earthly realm. And they're being pushed. And these are, again, very Catholic-based symbols, being casted out of heaven, of being reascended to heaven. Um, and even the name of Jesus is that IHS. It's not even a, it's not an image of him. It's not, it is that IHS, which is that combination of letters in the Catholic Church that represent Jesus. So you will not see IHS in any Protestant churches or anything like that. You only see it in the Catholic Church. And so they have that highlighted in that heavy light if you zoom in in the middle of the ceiling painting. So that makes it uh, very Catholic. Also, the use of the gilded ceiling. So it's painted. The ceiling is painted. And it's painted in a way with gilded, you know, gold paint where you don't know where the painting begins and where the architecture is. So the architecture is painted with this gilded gold. And then it transitions up into the actual um, stucco fresco painting. And you should remember what fresco is. Fresco is where you place the plaster upon the architecture because it grabs, because of the calcium in the, in the moisture. And then as it's drying, you add your pigments of a mixture of tempera and oil together. And then whenever it dries, it seals the oil pigment and the tempera pigment. And then it creates a crystalline structure and it allows it to look vibrant and luminous for years and years, hundreds of years down the road, still to today. So it's a fresco painting, but the gilded gold paint is literally just gold paint that's been placed upon the architecture. So you don't know where the architecture begins and where the fresco painting begins or ends and begins. Um, and then uh, Golis did one other new invention, which is <clears throat> so the ceiling exposure into the celestial heavenly realm is one. And then the second, so that would be real quick if you're standing and looking right up and you're looking as if you're viewing right into heaven and then the second invent is that he glazed the gilded archways to make it look like their shadows casted from heaven so if you look and you zoom in there are areas around the fresco central painting that are a little darker that you would think is the sunlight coming into the cathedral that's creating those those color shifts but it's not he's using what's called a glaze which is something that helps seal the paint over the top of the gilded paint on the architecture to give this shadow line and that shadow line is playing off of the celestial activity in the middle of the ceiling so he's glazing the architecture that has the golded or the gilded paint on top of it which gives it a whole new dimension so you have three dimension of the architecture moving into an illusionary three dimension of the glazed gilded paint on the architecture which darkens the gold then into the fresco two-dimensional illusion of ascending or descending in and out of heaven all right so it's moving from three-dimensional realm to the celestial realm and then back to the three-dimensional realm with the bodies being cascaded out of heaven because of their sins all right i'll leave you at that and then i'll do we'll do one more video on this chapter in regards to spain and we're going to focus heavily on painting with spain in particular <clears throat>